morning, Heritage. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And we're here to exalt his name. We're here to lift him up. We're here to glorify his name. He is worthy. Come on, put your hands together this morning.
that we can come in here and experience corporate worship, but God still wants to hear and to receive your individual praise and worship. I am just convinced and I have to remind myself all the time, all of the time, so many times the key to my breakthrough is my praise and my worship. I know a lot of times we come into church and we get in His presence. And what tends to happen, we begin to think about the things that are going on, the things that we're battling, the things that we're trying to get through in life. But if it pops in your head, if it has popped in your head this morning, I want you to remember to, to do one thing. As soon as it pops into your mind, give it to the Lord this morning. Give it to the Lord. Don't let it be a distraction today. If it came into your mind this morning, that's, that's a clear sign that God is the answer to that very need. Did you hear me today? If it popped into your mind, if you're trying to worship, but you got this thing you got to deal with in the coming days, if it popped in your mind, that is a clear indication that God says, I've got this thing, handle it. I'm going to handle this thing for you, but you just got to give it to me. So right now, come on, Jesus said, cast your cares on me, for he cares for us. Come on, just take that thing right there and just cast it on the Lord. Just give it to the Lord this morning. God, just give it, just give it to the Lord this morning. Just give all your cares to the Lord this morning. Just give all your cares. You don't, you don't want your, the cares of life to distract you from being able to worship the Lord. So, so as we release our burdens, as we release the, those things that we're carrying today, now we can worship. Now we can praise Him without distraction because He's got it today. Does anybody believe that this morning? Does anybody believe that He's got the very thing you're worried about? The very thing that's keeping you up at night? The thing that the first thing that the first issue that pops in your mind when you wake up in the morning let me tell you something God's got that if you'll give it to him God's gonna take it he's gonna use it and he's gonna prepare you through it somehow he's using the thing you're going through to prepare you for what's next hallelujah thank you Lord I guess thank you Lord it ain't easy all the time but I'll say thank you Lord anyway if it's gonna prepare me I'll say thank you I'll say thank you, Lord. If it's, if it's working something on the inside of me, I'll, I'll say thank you. I might not feel like thank you right now. I may not be able to see why it's good right now, but even still, I'll thank you even now because I know you are my God and you have my best interests in mind. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for taking every care. Thank you, Lord, for lifting every burden right now. We give them to you. We give them to you. Come on, give them to you. Give them to him, I mean. Use that are online right now. Give your burdens to the Lord right now. Use that are watching. Use that have joined us online right now. Give your burdens to the Lord. Give your burdens to the Lord right now. You're such an awesome God. Hallelujah. Come on, tell him. Tell him you're such an awesome God, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for grace. Thank you, Lord, for it. 
know in our hearts this morning, Lord. Thank you that you're here with us in this place. Thank you for meeting with us today. Lord, what a joy it is to be in your presence. What a joy it is to worship you this morning. Obed-Edom said, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. Come on, there's nothing like his presence. There's nothing like sitting in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I, I sense him filling the room. I, I sense him filling this atmosphere with his very presence. Come on, I understand that as the praises come out, the glory manifests. Come on, as the worship arises, his presence settles among us. Come on, come on, if you want to have an experience with me, a life-changing presence, come on, I, I sense his glory wanting to show up in this atmosphere but he responds to the praises and the worship of his people oh yes I said he responds to my praise so if I want more of his presence I lift up more praise if I want more of his glory I lift up more worship if I want more of him in my life I lift up what he has asked of me I live my praise I live my song I say, holy are you, Lord. I say, worthy are you, Lord. I say, you're such an awesome God. You're such an awesome God. And I love you today. And I worship you today. And I praise you today. I lift your name today. awesome God such an awesome God such an awesome God such an awesome God we're gonna pray over needs this morning Miss Sharon Sproul is battling shingles we want to pray for her this morning Sharon Smith is battling cancer we want to pray for her this morning Gary Hirsch battling cancer many friends many others that we know are battling cancer some folks still fighting COVID there's a lot of stuff going on but how many of you believe that our God is able to move and to touch and deliver and to do the miraculous come on do you believe it in here this morning I said come on I need more faith than that come on if your hand clap is a reflection of your faith we got we got we got some work to do but I know that you believe, I believe that you believe that God is able to move in every situation. I'm going to ask Chris, my wife, if she'll join me up here. I'm going to ask her to pray this morning over these needs that have been mentioned. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it's easy to praise God on the mountaintop. But can we praise him in the valley? There are so many people suffering babies dying, babies being born sick. Since my dad passed away um, in the fashion that he did, our phone literally rings off the hook with travesties that are taking place in facilities all around us. So let's pray. If you have a need, we don't want to rush. We don't want to rush the presence of God. There are people who might have come today thinking, if I don't get something today, I'm done. But God can heal you. He can heal your marriage. He can heal your backslidden child. All he asks from his people is that we trust him. That's a hard thing to do. Because sometimes we measure God and his existence and his goodness by our situation. But Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And look what happened to Job at the end. He was given a double portion of all that he had. So we're going to pray this morning. If you have a need and you feel like you want prayer, I'm going to ask you to come up. Because God can meet you right at the point of your desperation. He hasn't gone anywhere. His arm is not shortened. So, Father, I come to you right now on behalf of your children who are in need, God. We lift Sharon up to you this morning as she suffers and she's in pain. God, visit her by your Holy Spirit. And, God, your perfect will be done in her life. In the name of Jesus, give us wisdom how to reach out to people, what to say, God. But many times all we have to do is extend a word, extend a loving hand. God, we pray for Sharon Spruill, who cares so much for other people and gives people encouraging words. Lift her up, 
God, in the name of Jesus. God, for those who have children who, who their parents are worried sick about a broken relationship or maybe them uh, walking away from the family or being on drugs or having an addiction, God, we lift those children up to you. Most of them we've dedicated, Lord, to you, and we remind you and ask you, God, to hold them close, to protect them, Lord, but give your people the strength to walk day after day after day in boldness and in loyalty to you, God. We gave our lives to you, God. God, for the Tripp family, Lord, I pray that you would be with them as they lost their oldest son and now the mother, God. I ask for your comforting Holy Spirit to visit them, Lord, in the name of Jesus. God, for those who are suffering, uh, especially a lot of young people, Lord, with suicidal thoughts, God, and depression, Lord, we lift these teenagers up to you, Lord. I remember when we were young and we tarried at the altar and we, and we knew God and we asked him to help us. They were life-changing moments. Lord, let us provide that atmosphere where people are healed and delivered and it's not about a program and it's not about the agenda. God, it's about meeting you and us introducing people to you, Lord, who would otherwise die and perish in hell, God. Help us as the body of Christ to stand up and be strong, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Heal marriages, Lord. Heal marriages, Lord. There are so many who are struggling, Lord. Lord, let us dive into your word and do what your word says, Lord. Because if we all do that and we're obedient to that, we're going to be okay. God, for those suffering with the thoughts of suicide, God, I ask right now that your truth reach them, God. Set up divine appointments for your children, Lord, even in this room who are so burdened down and weighed down with their own problems. Lord, may we be a light to others because, Lord, when we reach out to others, somehow our problems don't seem so big. God, I ask your anointing on this service, Lord, for Chap. I pray, God, that you would speak directly through him and that people will be ministered to, God. We love you so much this morning. Meet the needs of your people, Lord, and we worship you and we love you. We dedicate our lives to you. May this be the turning point for that person who is in such need of you, God. In the mighty name of Jesus. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, Abba Father. You are worthy of our praise to you. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Come on, help me tell him. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. Yeah, you are awesome in this place, big hand clap of praise in here because he's good I said he's a good God he's a good God and he's worthy he's so worthy he's so worthy yes he is so worthy 
We bless your name. I'm excited to be in God's presence with you this morning. We're going to go ahead and dismiss Heritage Youth and Heritage Kids to their classes. Those of you that are here in the room, why don't you find someone around you, greet them, hug them, welcome them here this morning to the Lord's life-changing presence today. Hallelujah. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Heritage Church. Good to see you this morning. We are so glad that you are here. If you are joining us online, we say good morning and thank you for tuning in and spending part of your weekend with us. Just go ahead and drop us your favorite emoji in the comments below and let us know where you are watching from. And if you have a prayer request, you can put that in the comments as well because we pray for your needs faithfully each and every day. And if you are joining us for the first time, we say welcome to the family. I see a lot of new faces here today. We believe that church is more the Sunday experience and we want to do life together. You should have received a communication card when you came in and if you did not you can get one in the welcome center in the lobby but just go ahead and fill that card out as you feel comfortable and we will put a small token of thanks in your hand for turning it in at the welcome center just for checking us out this morning. It's important for us to stay connected and we have several ways that you can do that here at Heritage. First you can text the word informed to 94,000. And what that does is it puts you in our family data bank where you can keep updated on all things going on here at Heritage Church. Second is you can check us out on our Heritage Facebook page or finally our website www.heritagechurch.co and all three ways will keep you posted on things going on here. And to keep you posted, I know I mentioned this last week and I want you to remind you to put your calendars for February 26th and this is for all the men out there. There will be a men's breakfast at the Golden Corral, February 26th at 7 a.m. There is a special room for you guys, for you guys to hang out, eat a lot of bacon, a lot of biscuits, and talk about Jesus. Does that sound amazing? Bacon just makes everybody better, right? I love it. Well, usually at this time of the service, I have a fun story not today. <laughs> um, I love humor and I love to laugh and I love how God allows my life to be a story and how illustrations, he uses illustrations. He does it all through the Bible. But there is a big highlight that happened this week to me and I had a really great story planned today. It was an awesome story and maybe I'll say it next week. But it wasn't the time this morning because last night... I wrestled all night long and I didn't sleep and that's why I have these really amazing glasses on this morning. 
so you can't see my lashes that aren't very full this morning. But I just, instead of a story today, I'm just taking a minute as a cry. And it's a cry for the, our young people. And there's an attack on our young people. And this isn't, just, our culture is trying to kidnap our kids. And I was reminded of a story that I read a while ago, and it was this girl that had a pet snake, a python. And I don't know why you would want a snake, a python as a pet, but people do, I guess. This is a thing. And she had this nine foot python that she befriended. She had this snake since it was a baby and it grew and it turned into nine feet. And every night she would take the snake to bed with her. And there's a picture of her with this. I, if I had enough time, I would have got it. But every night she would curl up in a little ball to go to sleep and the python, would wrap itself from the top of her body around to her feet and up around, like it was measuring her. And then all of a sudden, the snake quit eating. So it alarmed this girl. So she took the snake to the vet and said, listen, my snake quit eating. I don't know what's going on. And the doctor alarmingly knew exactly what was happening. The snake was preparing and fasting for its next meal, her. And there is an enemy and there is a serpent. It started at the very beginning when he said, did God really say that? He said it to Eve. And what's happening in our culture is that they're telling our kids, did God really say that? God didn't say that. And Chap's been talking about an authentic you. And that is the exact thing that the culture is taking from our children. It is identity. Two people, one is a family member that I know this week tried to take their lives. There is an identity crisis happening here in our culture. It's affecting my family, and I guarantee you it's affecting yours. Because if you get on social media, don't be stupid. Because I know the kids in this building, and I'm looking at their TikTok as well. I'm on TikTok because I want to see what's going on. I'm not going to fall because I see TikTok. I'm looking at TikTok to see how I can counter the culture of what the enemy is doing. And I'm telling you, I was wrestling last night because the serpent is ready to take our kids and gobble them up in a way that they don't even know what's happening with them. And this is a cry this morning. I know we've already prayed for the kids. But listen, it's affecting my babies. I see the identity crisis. They were raised in church. I speak over them. I pray for them. I do prayer walks talking identity. But listen, they're, they're, at, they're still at the weight of the world. And it is our job. The Bible says, rouse the warriors. Do you know who the warriors are, guys? It is me and you, and you're not too old. You're not too young. It takes grandparents. It takes aunts. It takes uncles. It takes all of us to rouse up the warriors to pray for our kids. Without our prayers, what's happening? They're dying. And I don't want to see my babies in a casket because it's not that far off. But there's encouragement, and it's in the Bible. Luke 10, 19 says this, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall hurt you. We have the authority. So now is not the time, church, to back down. Now is the time to rise up for our children. They are the voices of the future. They are our future generation. They are the voices for Jesus. They might even be the martyrs, but they're willing to take their life because they don't know who they are. And they're not willing to take their life for Jesus because it's, they're blindsided. So I'm going to take a minute. And I know I, this is past my time. But it's worth it. It's worth it to take a minute to call out for our babies. So if you would just agree with me right now. In one, 
as warriors of faith that we would call out for our kids in heritage and, and their friends and their friends because they're dying, guys. Kids are dying. They're dying. And the enemy is laughing. And we need to be crying. We need to be as bold as the world is and tell them who they are because everyone else is telling them who they aren't. So if you have a young person in here, a child, a grandson, a granddaughter, a niece, a nephew, if you would just stand right now with me because this is the posture that we need to take. We need to stand for truth and stand for the name of the Lord and stand in a place where we are rousing the warriors for our generation upcoming children. So God, we just call out to you right now, Lord God. We call out to you for our children, God, for our babies, Lord Jesus, God. God, where are they going to be without you? And we pray, Lord God, that you would just capture their hearts, Lord God. God, that you would move in their hearts in such a way that they would never depart from you, God. We speak over their identity, Lord God. We call them child of God, Lord God. God, that they are the head and not the feet, Lord Jesus, God. We speak truth would penetrate their bodies, Lord God. We call them children of God. We speak life over them, Lord, where the enemy is coming in to try to take their life and identity, Lord God. We, we break the assignment over the enemy right now, God. And we take authority in the name of Jesus, God. You. Lord, 
thank you for our children. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Open our kids' eyes, God, to you, God. I just pray an encounter over them, even right now when they're back in their classes, Lord, or wherever they are, God. I just pray that they would have an encounter with you that would change their lives forever, Lord God. That you would keep them on a leash that they can never run too far, God. That you would yank them back to you, God. We thank you that your word does not return void. Thank you, Jesus. God, we believe it and we see it, Lord. We see it. ready to watch them stand and take their place. Not be backed down by the world, but it's time for them to counter the culture. And we need you. We need you to partner with us. God needs you. He has called you. You're not too old. You're not too young. You're a voice. You are a voice. So we can do it together. I believe it. I believe it. I believe we moved some things this morning. You may be seated. I believe we're going to see testimonies. I'm going to see testimonies. You're going to see testimonies. But this is, doesn't just stop after this minute prayer. If you can just every day set aside for our kids and pray for them, it changes them. It holds them. It keeps them. They need us. Our prayers can be the thing that gets them through. They're our heritage. That's what we're about here, building heritage. Amen. That was me last night. I even took PM Motron and it didn't make me go to sleep, so I feel a release. <laughs> we love you. And we're so thankful to have you as our family here at Heritage. And I'm thankful for a pastor chap that allowing that we can come together and pause and pray for our kids and family. Because that's what it's about, our heritage. So we are going to continue our worship right now with our tithe and our offerings. And we just want to thank you for your faithfulness here. Your giving allows us to continue to give to others and serve our community. We have several ways that you can sow and give here. We have something called smart giving that you can text a dollar amount to the number on the screen. Or you can simply drop off your envelope in a box located in the back of the building or mail in your check with the address on the screen. So we're going to just pray over our offering right now. So Lord, we just thank you, God, for this time of giving. We thank you for an opportunity just to give back, God, what you already have given us. It's yours. So we just pray that you would bless the giver, that you would bless the tithe, that you would bless the offering to expand your kingdom, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you when you give.
Powerful moment. Jeremiah 1. Turn with me, please, to Jeremiah 1. Andre, if you guys could just hang with me a moment. You know, that, that reality, this, this identity issue, this identity crisis that's going on in culture today, it's not just in kids. It's from five-year-old to 85 to 95. We're asking five-year-olds to determine their gender. Can, how does a five-year-old know? This, uh, and this is really why I believe that God has directed me in this direction. Talking about identity, talking about the authentic you. Because we need to, we need to, of course, be praying for our kids that they find out who they really are. But we need to walk in a place where we know who we are. So uh, we're going to continue the series, and I'm excited about today because we're finally going to get to our series text. So this is our third message in this series. We ain't got to our primary text yet. So I want to read from Jeremiah 1. If you would read with me, please, beginning at verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, me being Jeremiah. He came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth, for you shall go to all to whom I shall send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out, to pull down, to destroy, and to throw down, to build, and to plant. Father, I just ask that you would speak through us today. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Let us hear your words today. Let us know more about you and ourselves when our time is completed here today. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said together, amen and amen. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Back in 2012, there was a popular internet slang term that came about and it was this. Do you remember this word, YOLO? How many of you remember what YOLO stands for? You only live once. Yeah, it's an acronym for that phrase, you only live once. And the idea behind the phrase is that you only live once, so live doing what's fun. Live doing what's exciting. Uh, live doing what's pleasurable, even to the point of encouraging impulsivity over contemplation in the pursuit of life experiences. On the surface, that seems okay, acceptable, maybe even thrilling. But, uh, you know, after all, really, the, pr the premise of that statement is true. You really only do live once, but the reality is we don't just live once, we live forever. We live eternally, and this earthly life is only the first chapter of life. And the most important thing, how we live this life determines the rest of our existence, the how, the where, uh, the where we will be for the rest of time. So we really should give significant thought to how we live in this life. And, uh, you know, we do hope that this life has some fun and excitement, even some pleasure. But as believers, our highest calling, our highest mandate is one of obedience. That's our ultimate goal, to live a life of obedience, to live in obedience to the commands of God 
those which are found in his written word. Behavior and personal activity are very important in that they are a very close or very uh, specific reflection of someone's ambition and the condition of their heart. The substance really of this series and what we're really talking about is this, that personal activity is in direct connection to one's accepted identity. Who you believe you are is producing what you do. And, and, and the hard fact is that what you're doing is producing your destiny and your eternity. So that's why identity is so important. And what we're learning in this series is that proper identity can only be found from one source. Your creator, almighty God. And when we look at his word and we find that he's constantly trying to tell us who we are. We've been saying this for a few weeks. I'm hoping it's starting to sink in. And really the question is this. Will we believe what he has said that we are? Or who we are? It's very important. Because whomever you believe or whomever you have come to believe you are is determining what you do. Doing always flows out of being, not the opposite. Did you hear me? Doing always flows out of being. You can put someone in prison and physically contain them and keep them from committing violent or abusive acts for a period of time. But when they get out, they're going to do what? They're going to go right back to the same activity. Why? Because managing someone's activity temporarily does not change who they are. Being does not flow out of doing. Doing flows out of being. And the only way to change someone's actions in the long term is to change their heart first. And there's only one person that can change the heart. That is God. Satan, in the form of a serpent, had it all wrong in the garden. Do you remember the story? He proposed to Eve. Listen to what, remember what he said to Eve. He said, if you will do this, you will become. He said, eat and you will become like God. Do this and it'll change who you are. It doesn't work that way with spiritual things. Philippians 2.13 says, it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. If you're going to be elevated in spiritual things, God's going to have to be the one to do it. And the, it, this whole process begins by understanding and believing who God says you are. By the way, Eve was deceived when she encountered the serpent. How so? Because she fell for his offer, but what he offered her, she already had. He said, eat and you'll become like God. But remember, Genesis 1.26 says that she was already like God and that she was made in his image and in his own likeness. See, when you don't know who you are, when you don't know who you are in Christ, when you don't understand your God-given identity, you will engage in activity to become something that you already are. And you will do some things to achieve places that you already have. You might do stuff to feel loved, not realizing that the one who's important, the love that's important, you already have. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. You might do things to be accepted, not understanding that God simply asked you to come to him just as you are. You're already accepted. And when we come to God, he is the one who can change the heart. He is the only one who can change who we are. And when we change who we are, when he changes who we are, when we become who we're supposed to be in him, then our actions will follow. Identity. That's why we're talking about identity. It's so important because who you allow to define and determine your identity means the difference between a life wasted and a life fulfilled. So that's why we're talking about identity. This whole series is about discovering what God says or who God says you are and what he thinks of you. I'm just praying that, that, and, and hoping that you'll begin to believe that you are who God says you are. There's always a disconnect 
There, there's a distance between most of the time who I think I am and who God says I am. I'm just believing and praying that you'll begin to believe who God says you are and that you'll be, begin to believe that you can do what God says you can do. Who's with me in that this morning? So we're to our text, Jan, uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, and I want us to look at this. This, this, this text just gets me excited. I, I think we, we discover so much from this text because God doesn't just write this to Jeremiah. See, God is no respecter of persons. If God has this exchange with Jeremiah, if, if God did these things in regard to Jeremiah's life and spoke over his life and, and all of this that we're going to find out that God did behind the scenes even before Jeremiah came about, if he did it for Jeremiah, he's done it for me too. And he's doing it for you, and he has done it for you too. So Jeremiah 1, I want us to look at it. We are, we're given privy to a very critical conversation here, a very insightful conversation between God and Jeremiah. This is, this is no ordinary conversation. This is a dialogue about destiny. God is talking to Jeremiah about who he was born to be. And, and this is so powerful that, that God is talking to a man who he wants to step into prophetic ministry. He, he wants him to step into this role to become his own spokesman. He wants him to become his mouthpiece. And he wants him to be the, the finger on the fivefold hand. Because to understand that the, the apostle is the thumb because, because it covers the rest of the fingers. The prophet is the index finger because it points you in the right direction. The middle finger is the evangelist because it has the longest reach. The ring finger is the pastor because he's married to and comes into covenant with the sheep. And the pinky, pinky finger is the teacher because that's the only one that can get in your ear. Come on, somebody. <laughs> but he's calling him... He's calling Jeremiah to be, to be the prophet. He says, Jeremiah, I've called you to something specific. I've called you to be the prophet. See, it's, it's interesting, though. The first thing that we notice, he's, 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 he says, how are you you're telling me you want to, meet, to be a prophet, but you want to begin by, begin by talking about when, before I was born. Why do, you, why do you think he does that? Why, why is it that he's talking about his birth? It's because maybe it's significant that you understand the elements of your origin. Maybe it's significant that you truly understand that, that you can't understand your truly God-given identity until you understand where you came from or who you came from. And God starts the conversation talking to Jeremiah about his birth. Notice in the text, the first word of the text, so significant, he says, before I formed you. Before I formed you. See, we, we say life begins at conception, but God says, even before that, I knew you. Even before you were formed, I knew you. Before means not yet. I'm talking about before the sperm and the egg had yet come together. God said, I already knew you. Before you were in the womb, I knew you. When your mama and your daddy just started winking at each other, he said, I already knew you long before that. He said, they, they, they might not have planned you, but I already knew you. You may have been an accident in their eyes, but, but before they even thought of you, I already knew you. Even if the circumstances that produced your birth were sinful circumstances, before the sin was committed, I already knew you. David said in Psalm 51, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Many believe that, that this, from this verse that King David's birth was a byproduct of, a, of a, an adulterous relationship of his father Jesse. But, but aren't you glad that, that God can take what the devil meant for evil and turn it around for good? God says no matter the circumstances that brought your, about your birth, even before your birth, even before your conception, I knew you. Where were you before you were conceived in the womb? Where were you before your conception? You existed in the mind of God. You existed in the knowing, in the knowledge of God. And God knew you before you were born, and he knows you now. That's why some people say, if God were to cease to think about you, you would cease to exist. But he doesn't cease to think about us. His thoughts are on us day and night. 
and, and, and I'm just trying to get somebody to understand. Origin is important. You always know where something come from or where, where they came from because when they die, they go back to it. Mm -hmm. The plants come out of the ground. When they die, they go back to it. Can I just tell you, when you die, yes, your flesh will go back to the dust from which it came, but your spirit will go back to God because that's from where you came. You came from God this morning. I'm trying to get you to understand your identity this morning. Come on, let's keep reading. He says this. He says, understand the kind of, there's a chronology of events here. He says, first I knew you, then I formed you. Your parents, listen now, your parents made you. An act of humanity may have made you, but God says, I formed you. What does it mean to form? To form means to fashion for a predetermined person, purpose. To fashion for a predetermined purpose. He determined, okay, this one's going to need this one. This one's going to need that. This one's going to need this. This one's going to need that. And, and he, he's going to need this much strength. She's going to need this much talent. They're going to need this much ability. They're going to need this much height and this color eyes and, and this color skin, this kind of personality, this IQ. And he brings he predetermined all of that. He predetermined all that you were supposed to be, and then he formed you. He formed you. He said, I put everything in you that you needed to be you for you to do what I built you to do. He formed you. So he knew you, and then he formed you. Let's keep reading. Next he says, then I sanctified you. When he sanctified you. When did he do that? Before you were born. So there's kind of a, first of all, the, the word sanctify means set apart as sacred. To be used in service for the king. You are set apart. You are called to be used for the purposes of the king. God says to Jeremiah, this text implies actually this timeline, this sequence of events. First, he knew you. Then he formed you. And then he sanctified you. It almost implies that in between conception and birth, that's where sanctification takes place. While, you're, while the baby is being carried in the womb. Ladies, pray over your babies. Fathers, pray over your babies that are in the womb. They are so important. Maybe that's, I think that's what's insinuated here. That it's in the carrying stage. It's in the development stage that God sanctifies the, 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 the young boy, the young, the young woman, the young child, the girl. He does that. He sanctified you. He said, I sanctify you. First I knew you, then I formed you, and then I sanctified you. I set you apart. I gave you a distinction. You are set apart. You are chosen for the master's use. He said, I sanctified you, and then I ordained you. A prophet to the nations. I ordained you. Before you were born, I called you and I entrusted you with an assignment to be a prophet to the nations. Now listen, I don't want you to miss this right here. Do you catch what God is saying here? He's saying, before I formed you, I saw the prophet in you. You were a prophet. Follow me now. You were a prophet. You had a prophetic ministry before you had a body. You had a prophetic ministry long before you had a birth. And when the body got here, I saw a prophet, God says. I never saw just a baby. I saw a prophet. And even when you went through some tough times, I still saw the prophet. I didn't see an addict. I saw a prophet. I didn't see somebody broken. I saw a prophet. I didn't, I didn't see an adulterer. I saw a prophet. I didn't see an alcoholic. I saw a prophet. I didn't see a thief or a liar or a conniver. I saw what I had put in you. I saw a prophet. I didn't see insecurity. I didn't see anxiety. I didn't see timidity. No, I saw a prophet. I saw what I had called you to be. Can I just tell you, no matter what you did, it didn't change. It doesn't change what God sees when he looks at you. And so now, Jeremiah, no matter what you've done, I've shown up to introduce the you that you think you are to the you that you were born to be. I came to reintroduce you to yourself. See, culture, 
Culture encourages people, go find yourself. But God says, let me introduce you to who you already are. <laughs> Did anybody hear that this morning? Everybody's on a search to find themselves as if they're going to discover it in the world or in a career or in relationships. God says, come to me and let me introduce you to the you that you already are, the you that you were in my mind, the you that you were in the womb, the you that you were at your birth and ever since you've been growing and developing in this life. Come on, come to me, walk with me, come into relationship with me and I'll introduce you to the you that you really are because the real you and the real me is only found in him see we think we think if who I am isn't dysfunctional that that's destiny did you hear me we, we assume that if my life is not a mess then I must be living it all right my life this must be what I'm supposed to do not necessarily Come on, is anybody going to help me in here this morning? Not necessarily. I could have gone into mechanical engineering. That wouldn't have been dysfunctional, but neither would it have been destiny. I could have gone into uh, the, the secular music film, uh, uh, career or field and, and maybe made it as a secular musician. That may not necessarily have been dysfunctional, but it certainly would not have been destiny. Do you understand? It wouldn't have been destiny because I was born to be standing right here where I'm standing right now doing what I was predetermined to do. Just because your life ain't a mess don't mean that you're doing what God called you to do. Are you doing what God called you to do? Just because I'm not doing wrong doesn't mean I'm doing right. I, I need to make sure that I'm doing what God has called me to do. And so God interrupts Jeremiah's life and he says, Listen, I don't know what you had planned, but, but let me tell you what you were born for. See, that's what I'm believing will happen in this series. I don't know what you got planned, God says. I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what kind of plan you're following. I don't know what kind of journey you're on. But I want you to understand this is what I called you to do. This is what I predetermined you to do. Life is always about constant assessments. Am I in the right place? Am I the right person? Am I with the right people? Am I doing the right thing? Because if I'm not, I'm not fulfilling what God put in me to do. This is what I called you to do, Jeremiah. I called you to be a prophet. Notice Jeremiah's response, verse 6. Ah, Lord God. As if to say, hmm, ah, oh, you talking to me? He says, God, I cannot speak. Behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. Jeremiah saying, I, I failed speech class. And, and I'm way too young to be a prophet. A prophet? I'm way too young. Notice the gap in the thinking. Notice the gap in the thinking of what he thinks he is himself and what God says that he is. God's saying, I see a prophet, but Jeremiah is seeing himself as not qualified and lacking experience. Now, I want us to look at this with all intents and purposes, trying to understand Jeremiah as if he was living in today let's 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 use a new testament term let's just say he's saved jeremiah is saved jeremiah is right with god jeremiah has a heart for god and he don't know what he's supposed to be doing you think it's not possible for you or i to get off track to miss a turn to not to, you know, to get our mind on something? Are, are you like me? Sometimes you get your mind on something and, and you're so determined to make that happen that you don't care what gets in the way. No matter what happens, you, you, you're going to make sure that happens. Are you with me? Are you with me? I want this. Have you prayed about it? Well, I don't have to pray about it. Well, yeah, you better. That's my wife tells me all the time. You better pray about it. You better pray about it. Just because you're doing it don't mean it's wrong, but it might not be God, so you better pray about it. Be, be, be aware of not being so headstrong that, you know, why would God have a problem with this? I don't know, but he might. 
he would have a problem with this because he's got something better. Let's say he's saved. Let's say he's right with God. And for all, uh, he is. He is. The Bible tells us that. God says, You're a prophet. Jeremiah says, I think you got the wrong number. I'm not a prophet. I can't even speak, and I'm too young. I I'm just praying, Holy Ghost, come get somebody right now. Come get somebody right now. I pray that right now you go up and down every row in this room right now, every row of chairs. I pray you start pulling on stubborn hearts, people who, who don't want to hear that you're calling them to do something. I, I pray that you'll make every comfortable, uh, just settled person uncomfortable. Get them out of their seats. Get them out of their position. Get them out of wherever they are if they've missed it. Because it's about finding his will for our life. Too many people, too many people, even here under the sound of my voice, have been saying things like Jeremiah. No, I ain't doing that. I got a background ministry. I can't speak. Surely, surely you're not calling me to do something I can't do. Do you understand that oftentimes that's exactly what God does? He calls you to do things that you don't think you can do. Because if you thought you could do it, you do it relying on your own self. But he calls us to do things that we'll have to rely on him to be successful. You can't do it on, on your own. That's how he wants you to get out of the gate. Understand that you got to rely on him to be able able to accomplish what he's calling you to do. That's why he calls you to do things that you don't think you can do. I can't do it. I can't do it. This is not an isolated incident. God came to Gideon, called him to lead Israel in a military expedition to overcome the Midianites who were oppressing them. But God, when he found him, Gideon was, was not bold. He was not courageous. He was uh, certainly no experienced military leader. No, actually, when God found him, he was a man filled with and infected with fear, hiding out at a wine press, threshing wheat. But suddenly the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Not only does God call you to do things that you can't do, God, when he comes to you, he calls you things that you are not yet. And he gives us a picture of what we can become. God found Gideon doing exactly opposite of what he was calling him to do. But he still called him. He still called him. You mighty man of valor. The angel said, you mighty man of valor, the Lord is with you. See, here's the thing. God always speaks to our deficiencies. He speaks to what we are not. Not just Gideon. How about this guy? He said, come over here, Moses. Spoke to him out of a burning bush. Come over here. And what does Moses say? Same thing. You must have the wrong guy. I don't speak. What's wrong with these people in the Old Testament? They have literacy problems or what? I, I don't know. Nobody could speak. <laughs> Moses says the same thing. I, I have a background ministry out here in the desert. And so we are so many times just like these people. There's a gap between how God sees them and how they see themselves. The same applies to us. There is a gap between how we see ourselves and how God sees us. See, these guys were trapped in a case of mistaken identity. Now they used that term a while ago. Trapped in a case of mistaken identity, and God interrupts their lives to introduce them to who they were born to be. God, introduce somebody today. Speak above the excuses. Speak above the labels. Speak above the mistakes. Speak above the failures. Speak above. Speak louder than the mistaken identity and introduce somebody to who they were born to be. Jeremiah says, I cannot speak and I'm too young. 
Look what God says to him in verse 7. He says, do not say you're too young. Do not say you're too young. Notice God didn't deny his youth. Jeremiah was probably about 17 years old at this time. God didn't deny his age. He didn't argue with him. Jeremiah probably said, I'm too young. And God probably said, you're right. I'm wretched. Yeah, you're right. I'm lazy. You're right. I'm a hot mess. Yes, you're right. Lord, I'll go off in a minute. Yeah, you're right. You're right about all that, God says, but don't speak it. Don't keep talking about who you used to be. Don't keep talking about who you are without me. I didn't come to introduce you to the you that is outside of me. I came to and interrupted your life to introduce you to the you that's found in me. I'm trying to introduce you to the you that you were born to be. Is anybody hearing this this morning? Don't speak it. Reminding yourself of who you were has no redemptive value. If talking about your, defen- your deficiencies would help you, I'd let you talk about it, God says. But, but because there's no benefit, let's eliminate what you're trying to use as an excuse from the conversation. God says, if I let you, you'll use your deficiencies as an excuse. But God says, no, don't do that. Listen to this. He says, I'm not going to let you create a limitation when there isn't one. (laughs) I'm not going to let you create a limitation when there isn't one. Why isn't there a limitation? Because he is with me. See, we see our deficiencies as limitations. But God says, when I am with you, every limitation is removed. So stop telling me how old you are. Stop telling me how much experience you don't have. Stop telling me which side of the tracks you were born on. Stop telling me who wasn't there. Stop telling me what you've lost. Stop telling me who walked out on you. Stop telling me what you've been through. Stop telling me who didn't love you. My grace is sufficient when you feel deficient. I said, my grace, God says, his grace is sufficient in the areas that we feel deficient. And yes, all of those things happen, but it does not change what was put in me to develop in me and cause me to become what I was created to become. I don't want to allow excuses to turn into limitations and cause me to get sidetracked and never fulfill my destiny for the kingdom of God. So I allow a life interruption. And I let him come to me and speak to me and say, this is what I've called you to do. He says, it would be one thing if you talked about it as part of your testimony, but you're still talking about it as this. It's an excuse to be stuck. So shh, hush. Don't talk about your limitations. Don't talk about your deficiencies anymore. And then this is interesting. Notice this, that God goes beyond what Jeremiah is saying and addresses what Jeremiah must have been thinking. Because God says in verse 8, do not be afraid of their faces. Jeremiah hasn't said anything about being afraid. (laughs) But isn't God the kind of God that can discern what you're not saying but what you're thinking? Some of our our limitations we're willing to talk about. Some we don't, we just think about. So God's saying, don't not just talk about your limitations or the limitations you're talking about. Don't don't just stop talking about it. Quit thinking about your limitations. Quit thinking about the things, the reasons, the excuses that that you can't be used, that you can't uh, can't be used in a powerful way, that that the talents and and the giftings that I've given to you, that they're from for some other purpose. Quit quit thinking that way. Quit saying that way and quit thinking that way. Every limitation is removed if you are in me. And then he says to Jeremiah, you shall go to all whom I 
shall send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. That's such a powerful verse in verse 9. Jeremiah says that the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, see, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. The Lord said, you will speak for me. So the Lord touched him and put in him the words that he would say. That's what God does for us. Whether he's calling us to speak for him or to sing for him or just to talk about him or to be an example for him in the workplace, in the marketplace. Whatever God does or commands us to do, he always comes down and touches us and puts within us what we need to fulfill that calling and that destiny. So Jeremiah goes on to become and to do Exactly what God called him to do because, listen, because he chose to believe what God said about him above what he said of himself. And when we learn about God and our God-given identity, when, when you were talking about this authentic you thing, what we learn is this, that God comes to us. He speaks over us. He invites us on an adventure to discover what he has put in us before we were ever formed. But here's the key. And this is so true. You'll never discover what's in you until you say yes to, what, to who he says, he are, says you are and yes to what he's called you to do. You, you're never going to know what has been put in you until you embark on this journey with God. You may have big dreams. You may have big plans. You may think, hey, I'm good at this. I can do this or that. But you'll never come to understand what was put in you, part of your identity, before you were born, before you were conceived, before you were ever thought of by your parents. When God was putting and, and putting together, gathering the ingredients for your life, what he gathered together and put in you and formed you from, you'll never get a taste of it. You'll never get to see it until you find the real you that's located in Christ. See, there's some things in me that I believe in me, I hope are in me and in us that I'm looking forward to seeing. I believe there's a building in me. I believe there's a new sanctuary for Heritage Church, not just in me, but it was in those that came before me, and it's in you. I believe that we're going to build a greater facility on this campus. I'm hoping we can do that to where we can have greater influence. See, I believe that's, that's something in me. See, some of you, there's songs in you. The songs in you that are yet to be born. I believe that over this worship team. I just speak that over Andre and this worship team. I just, I just believe there's songs to be birthed out of this house. Come on. We're moving to a place where I love everybody else's song, but how many of you know we got our own song? You, we got our own song. Heritage Worship Team has got his own song. We're about to birth those things. Come on. What has God put in you? Come on. Some of you got ideas. Some of you got, got uh, uh, all kinds of things, solutions. You got marketplace ideas. You got got business ideas. You've got things that can bless others. All kinds of things we'll never know until we are making sure that we're walking in Christ and discovering and finding our true identity. It only is going to happen in him. See, see Jeremiah didn't know prophecy was in him until he believed God, until he believed what God said. And when he believed God, what God said, then prophecy came. He never prophesied until he received the word of the Lord and then began to walk in the assignment. Many of you have no idea what's in you because you haven't seen it yet. Some of you think that the only thing you are is what you've seen already. But I'm trying to get someone to understand this morning that there's something in you that goes beyond what you could ask or think. And God wants to tell you this morning, I know you, I have always known you, but you still don't know you yet. 
Every person in the room, hear me. You still don't know you yet until you completely surrender. Do that and I'll show you more and more. I'll continue to introduce you to the real, authentic you. But it's a journey. It requires constant and consistent obedience. The other day, I, uh, I put on a pair of pants. Andre, if you'll come on, please. The other day I put on a pair of pants that I hadn't worn in a long time. And, uh, and I felt, uh, just means I got too many pants, Gary. <laughs> Dug to the bottom of the drawer. But I felt a piece of paper in my pocket. And when I reached for that piece of paper, I found, or I pulled out a $20 bill. $20. Ooh, $20. I mean, I get excited over $20. You know, $2. I get excited over $2. I mean, it's more than I had. I mean, come on. I pulled out that $20, and I used it. I used it. I used that $20. Listen to me. I wouldn't have been able to use it if I didn't have it. And I wouldn't have had it. Unless I reached for it. It was already there. But I didn't know it was there. It had been there a long time. I, I don't know when it got put there. I don't remember why it was there. It was just there. But it was put there the day before I found it. And when I reached for it. I found something that had never been used. Not because it wasn't there, but because I didn't know it was there. If I had known it was there, I'd have went and found it. And what makes this whole story crazy is the day I found it was not the day it was put there. It's been there a long time. I don't know. But then I found it and I used it what I didn't know I had. See, you'd be surprised to know what you can be and what you can do if you'll just reach for it. And what God wants to push you to do through this series is to reach like you've never reached before. Not based on your opinion of who you are or what you can do, but based on His. And I want to, I want to challenge you to understand this, that there are things that are there that you are yet to find. There are places and opportunities that you're yet to experience. There are parts of you that you are yet to know. And I'm just believing that God is encouraging somebody just to go for something that you've never done before. Reach for things that you've never seen or experienced before. Understand. Understand your significance. Your birth, your life, your identity, your destiny, your eternity. It is not by chance. It was all orchestrated by your Creator. Before I formed you, I knew you. Before you were born, I called you. I sanctified you. I set you apart and ordained you. See, there's a calling on your life this morning. There's a calling on your life. I never forget one of the saddest stories that I ever heard when I was in Bible school. My Bible school was a part of a church a local church and that church supported our school and so when we had church members of the community came that were not part of our school our college but one night in a testimony service I heard a man stand up 
or I saw a man stand up, and when I saw him, everybody would have known who he is because this man was very wealthy. He owned car washes all over the city. Seven or eight car washes he owned all over the city. So, of course, you know, he was treated with great respect, and everybody know, knew of him that, that way. Well, that night, I heard him stand up with tears down, rolling down his eyes. Publicly, he asked God to forgive him. He said, I'm a wealthy man. I've made a lot of money and been very successful in world, by the world standards. He said, but at 18 years old, God called me to preach, and I denied the call. And he said, I will go to my grave with regret, knowing that I never fulfilled my destiny. Friend, I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want that to happen to you. I want to encourage you to begin a pursuit to discover the real you. And within that real you is a real calling. It might be to church ministry. It might be, be becoming a pastor or becoming a prophet or an evangelist or a teacher, a missionary. But it might be a calling to the marketplace. It might be a calling to sales. It might be a calling. It can be anything, really. But my challenge to you today is don't reject the calling, no matter your age. I remember thinking as that man spoke, listen, you're not dead yet. Who said you're too old? If somebody tells you too, you're too old, I, I just want to know who said it. Because unless God said it, I don't have enough money. Who says you don't have enough money to do what God's calling you to do? Who says? I missed the window. I missed the window of time, and, and I don't feel like I can't go back in time. No, you can't go back in time, but you're still breathing. You're still inhaling and exhaling. You're still breathing. And God allows you turns. God will fix the road. God will bring you back. And somehow, if you'll give your life back to him and just come back to that spot and say, God, I know I blew it. I know I missed it. But here I am, Lord. What can you do? I just believe that the God, of, of the creator of the universe, and the one who created and formed your life can fix the situation. And he'll let you walk in your purpose and your destiny. If you'll just say, God, I know there's a lot of excuses, but I'm throwing out the limitations because I know I've got you. Do what you can. Do what you can with me. Come on, stand in here with me this morning, if you would, please. Hallelujah. God, speak to us in here today. God, speak to us. God, speak to us. heart and soul say yes will your spirit still say yes oh so there is more that I require of thee
Así es, más sucedió. feel the spirit of the Lord is talking to some people in here this morning maybe it's a maybe it's about just surrendering your life to him maybe you don't know him personally maybe you don't know the real you because you haven't even begun that journey Jesus wants to introduce you to the real you this morning maybe you want to give your life to Christ we'd love to pray with you around this altar maybe the Lord is dealing with you about doing something specific maybe God has always talk to you maybe God has always called you to do something and maybe you just can't figure it out yet maybe you don't you've not been willing to take the first step because you couldn't figure it all out at one time most of the time that's not how God works God says take the first step of obedience and then I'll show you the next one but maybe that's who you are maybe 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 God's been calling you to do something and you're just yet to say yes. Maybe maybe this morning around this altar, you could just come and say, God, I'm giving you everything. I'm going to give you everything. I'm not going to hold back anything. I'm tired of the excuses, Lord. I, I want a life fulfilled. I want a life of destiny. I want a life where I do exactly what you called me to do. So, Lord, I'm coming this morning and I'm declaring, God, whatever yes means for me, I'm a yes man. I'm a yes woman. Lord, I, whatever you're calling me to do, the answer is yes. As we sing this again, come on. This is a corporate response to this word. This is a corporate response to this challenge in the spirit. Lord, I say yes to your will, yes to your ways, Lord. I'll say yes. Come on, we're going to sing this again. Come on, as we declare this, as we shout it from our hearts, come on, fill this altar if you desire somebody to help you pray and to pray through to your next place. Come on, we say oh, yes. My soul. Say yeah.
and so say yes. Thank you, Lord. Oh, oh, oh. will your spirit just say yes? Oh, oh yes. Said there is more that I I require of thee. The Lord says, will your heart and soul say yes? Oh, now will your heart and soul say yes? Come on, he's asking you today. He's asking you today. He's asking you today. Will your heart and soul say There is more that I, I require of you. Oh, will your heart and soul say yes? Yeah, say yes. Give him big praise in here today. Ah, oh, come on, you can do better than that. Come on, somebody say yes. Come on, say yes. Say yes. Yes, Lord, to your will and to your way. Ah, yes, ah, yes. Say yes. Yes, a three-letter word can change anything. A three-letter word, Y-E-S, one syllable, all you have to do is say it, and it'll be the key that unlocks the purposes that God has for your life. I was thinking really fast, would I tell my kids yes 
and they're expecting a no, how exciting it is for them. And just picture the excitement of God right now. He expects you to say a no, but you're saying yes now because it's always no, but now today you're saying yes. So picture the joy that he is ha having by your yes. That's exciting, guys. Yes and amen. That's what they say. Yes and amen. Well, it's been amazing today to get together, and we look forward to doing it again next week. So we pray that you would have an amazing week. Remember, be strong, hold to the truth, and speak without fear. God is moving in your life. We love you. We'll see you next time.